and uh, you know, I mean, I don't want other parents to 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 go through you know what I've gone through, right? It's not it's not fun. You know, it's um, it's something that stays with you forever. You know, and I just you know, kids need to be they need to know that they're not invincible. You know, and I, I hope that when they when people drive by here, they realize that. We're not invincible. This is my daughter, Christy. She was 20 years old when she passed away in a car accident right here um, on September 4th, 2005. It'll be five years this September. She was one of, actually one of four fatalities, I believe, that was here. The driver of the car also passed away, the one that hit them. In recent years, roadside memorials have become a common sight along British Columbia highways, marking the site where people have lost loved ones in road accidents. Ranging from the laying of simple flowers to elaborate shrines, these memorials have become markers of individual grief, transforming public land into private sacred space. Now, what lies behind them? What do they mean for those who put them there? And what do they say about attitudes to death and grieving? It's, it's, it's a public way of, of dealing with grief, in part because I think as a secular society, we no longer have a standard set of behavior around grief. Uh, we don't sit Shiva, for example. You know, we don't have that sense of, sense of, well, if this is Tuesday, then this is what I must do in the process of grieving. You know, I've got two months in which I have to accomplish A, B, and C. We don't function that way anymore. There are no rules. Uh, it's much the same in the, at the undertakers. Uh, if, if, uh, if you're attending a memorial service or you're going to a, a, a funeral that's held in a funeral home or in a church, um, nowadays one will find all kinds of odd things, I mean, whether it's PowerPoint lectures, music, singing, uh, karaoke. Um, I, I went to a, a friend's uh, father's funeral some time ago he was engaged in the dairy industry, there's a milking machine, uh, artifacts of his business, his, his, his livelihood were there. That simply wasn't on the cards 20, 30, 40 years ago in British Columbia. So that's a substantial change. So personalizing death, trying to remember the individual, the whole individual, uh, that's a new feature and that's part of what we see in roadside death memorials. Many people who put up the memorials do so because they want that person to be remembered. And so what it does is individualize road death as it presents us with a new way of engaging with road trauma so that we don't see road death as just another statistic. But this was a particular person, somebody's son, somebody's father, somebody's daughter, and people love them and they are missed. For me, what I, one of the things that I work with and again, what I find is when you're trying to get clarity around things, sometimes semantics can be helpful. I mean, words are just empty structures, but as we give them meaning, we can start to make meaning around some of the, our experiences. And for me, if you think about mourning, as well as celebration, as needs, then how do you meet your need for mourning? How do you meet your need for celebration? I think road, roadside memorials are a way of honoring the person who died. It doesn't matter um, what the circumstances were. Um, somebody loved them, and they were somebody's child, somebody's father, somebody's husband. Um, in our case, it was our son, and he wasn't... We don't have any answers about what happened that day. Uh, he just drove off the road suddenly and we don't know if he was reaching for something or just what happened but um, we certainly need to we needed to visit where he died to feel something there and and then to erect a, a, in our case it was just a, a cross my husband made out of metal sprayed it black and and it has his name on it and it's always nice when we go there and we don't go there as much as we used to as often as we used to 
but it's always nice to see a flower there and know that somebody has come and they've remembered him. And I think when your child dies, the biggest fear you have is that they'll be forgotten. You can't remember what they sounded like. You can't remember things about them. Um, their friends continue to age and move on with their lives and they stay the age they were when they died. So Andy will always be 18 for us and we don't ever want people to forget that he was here. So roadside memorials, I don't believe they hurt anybody and I think they're a very healthy way of remembering somebody and honoring them. The practice itself indicates that there is a movement away from the belief that the church and state has control over grief and mourning, and has control over the ceremonies and rituals associated with death. It is authentic and personal, and the interesting thing about it is, it indicates that in our society, people are looking to express spirituality in their own way and to engage with the spiritual life. And there is a strong sense at these memorials that people making them have a very strong sense that something spiritual is going on while they are there. The roadside memorial is particularly important because it indicates to us that there is a new way of looking at grief and mourning. There is a tradition of taking grieving outside of, uh, outside of the church, outside of the, uh, the conventional sites of grief, uh, into the streets, memorial parades, uh, uh, processions, funeral processions, that sort of thing. Long traditions of this. Cenotaphs in British Columbia are a really good example of this. Uh, more British Columbians died on a per capita basis. More British Columbians gave their lives in the First World War. Uh, then it was much. It was higher than the national average. Every town in BC saw some. Any any town of any size in British Columbia saw some of their local boys killed in the First World War. Almost everywhere you go in BC, you'll find a cenotaph. It's a site of public mourning. It's not within a church churchyard. It's not within a cemetery. Typically, it's somewhere in the public domain. But we see the roadside death memorials within that context as something that's, uh, that's authentic, that's spontaneous, it's idiosyncratic, it's, it speaks to what the individual was like, what they were about. It's not constrained by, by uh, convention. Um, some of them are hugely unconventional. And uh, many of the artifacts one, find, one finds at roadside death memorials would never be allowed into a cemetery, not least for safety reasons. Uh, so that they're inventive, they're creative, uh, they're democratic, anyone can get one, all you need is a couple of hockey sticks and, an, and a hammer and nail and you're off to the races. Uh, that they make for just, just fine roadside death memorials. Uh, and that's not necessarily true in the case of funerals and cemeteries and headstones, that's expensive stuff. And it's so expensive that the families of course tend to take ownership of that process. There's not a lot of space left for friends, and particularly for young friends. Uh, where do you, how do you go about, where do you go about expressing your, your grief and, and the specificity of your grief? What's really unique about this person, this individual? Roadside uh, memorials, great option. Roadside memorials have become very important. It becomes sacred space, regardless of the fact that it is actually a public roadside. And so we have the appropriation of public space for private mourning. And there is great debate about whether or not they should be allowed. Emergency service personnel, for example, or people who have been involved in the crash, or people who live near the memorial site, often find it very difficult to travel past these memorials constantly, day after day, being reminded of the great tragedy, and must adopt coping strategies. So to me, when we, uh, when we go by roadside memorials, um, it's really just a reminder of what what happened, especially if you were working that day or um, you were involved in any way, shape, or form in the call. You're, you're reminded of, of what happened. Um, if you drive past a roadside memorial and you weren't involved, <clears throat> then you you always wonder what happened, and that's usually as far as it goes. Um, you don't want to think about who was involved or why it happened because. Y 
you know, if if we didn't desensitize ourselves to that, we would we wouldn't be able to do our job. Uh, certainly, everywhere that we go, uh, you see signs of of these memorials, and uh, there seems to be a duality to them uh, in my mind. One, they're a reminder of tragedy, a reminder of, of uh, human lives that have been lost, and they're also, um, I think, put up in the hopes that people will see them for what they are and respect them, and hopefully that will uh, be in the forefront of their minds as they drive. But the phenomenon of roadside memorials is not without its critics. There are some who believe roadside memorials are a distraction, and an eyesore, and even being the cause of more accidents. Recently, Kelowna City Council was asked to do something about roadside memorials, which, according to some, can be distracting to drivers. This sparked a local uproar, which has since subsided. Many of those who erect memorials actively maintain them. Yeah, you know, we've certainly heard people say, make the case that roadside death memorials are a distraction. Uh, that uh, roadside death memorials cause uh, further accidents. Others, of course, take the position that they're um, a warning. Um, and we, we often hear people say, and we see it in papers, you know, building, someone's building a roadside memorial to their friend. He should not have died in vain. At least his death will have some value because there'll be this big white cross that will warn people that this intersection is dangerous. So you have these two rather different perspectives. One, that, 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 that they're a distraction they caused, they might, might cause further death. They're uh, meant to prevent it, and they're, some people say they're effective at doing so. Um, I think they both kind of miss the point, is that they're, they're really not about, well certainly I'll, 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 I'll make the case that the distraction argument is a, is a weak one. If you're distracted by, if you're fatally distracted by a white cross beside the road, you're probably going to be distracted by the radio, the weather, stop signs, any number of things you probably shouldn't be driving. You know, get your focus together and, 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 and you know, get beyond that one. So I, I just don't see that as having much in the way of credibility. Every year I come in around October, pick everything up. Every year I come back, usually earlier this year, but my mother-in-law had breast cancer, so she's had breast surgery, so. But we're usually here a few times a year, cleaning things up, bringing things. I usually go that way. And her friends always give me things to bring up as well. And Every year I truck these plants up from Squamish. <laughs> There's a fellow there that has beautiful plants and I go all the time and I buy lots and lots and one day he asked me, you know, why do you buy so many plants? You know, just because there, I had about 10 bundles, I think. And so I, I had told him, you know, what I do a few times a year and now every time I do this, he always gives me money off and Ask me if I'm okay, and you know, so. These are pretty. Well, it's just a community needs it to remember. They feel so bad that right away one of the white crosses went up, and I didn't even know who put it there, but it was comforting to know that other people, okay. they're devastated and they want to communicate to the family that how they know they're helpless to do anything with your loss. And then one of Josie's friend's dads fabricated the metal one and he put it up there and put, did the engraving. So none of it was prompted by me, but I really appreciated it a lot and got a lot of comfort. And then uh, we had our first memorial service there a month on, after the accident and we gathered by the roadside and it's just comforting to know you have the community support. And also in this case you have lots of school children walking by that very spot every day so it's important to keep it up so that they remember to be safe when they're walking home. Yes, I weed whack the weeds and stuff. It's important to, to show the community that you're caring for it so that people remember it, right? Basically, I think it's important for us to maintain the cross. Unfortunately, everyday life does come in between everyone's time to come in be able to maintain it doesn't mean that we don't stop at the cross every day, it doesn't mean that we don't notice it or 
for me, I especially take that route home a lot to try and pay my respects to Tyson and not have anything get in between doing that. Unfortunately, the where the cross is, it's a very busy road, so a lot of the times all we can do is just drive by rather than stop and spend the time to maintain it. But a couple times a year, it's good for us to take it down, repaint it, keep it looking nice, and we've just now been talking about having somewhat of a permanent cross put in that's maybe steel, something that's not gonna get weathered as much, and not be an eyesore as some people have liked to put it. We think it looks fine, but obviously there's some members of the community that don't agree with us. On a dark and rainy evening, January 13th, 2010, on Bottomwood Lake Road, Josie Evans, while walking home from school, was struck and killed. A roadside memorial soon sprung up at the spot where she died, a cross surrounded with flowers, stuffed animals, candles, and handwritten poems and cards. This summer, family and friends of Josie held a memorial gathering in a local park to dedicate a bench located under her favorite tree. Uh, Josie, she's 15. She's a very nice young lady. Um, full of humor and life. Easy to get along with. Very, very thoughtful of others. Kind girl. Quiet. Uh, did well in drama. Remembered her lines very well and performed very well with loud, you know, loudness and enthusiasm. So she got her chance to to shine in drama, and she also played in the school band. Was able to be involved in those activities, which was what she was coming home from jazz band on that day that she got struck. The spot where it is, obviously, these it comes the the, the memorials go up right at the accident site because that's the first obvious place that people focus on. And it's in front of someone's property, even though, it, and then we all gather there, and I'm not sure he's all that comfortable with it, to have it there. But there's nothing you can do about it. It's there, and I think it's a good reminder that it's there, and that people know what memorials stand for. You don't just breeze by. And maybe if you've never lost a loved one in a traffic accident, driving by a roadside memorial, remember, there's a family story behind that on both sides. Usually, because someone causes the accident and somebody gets hurt. And in this case, it's a whole community that felt like because we're a small community. So, um, just that, it, just very thankful for all the community support. And in my case, it's been a testament to their support and just how they feel so bad about my loss, even though they know there's nothing they can do to replace Josie. So, they're with me though, and then it helps you get through. Janet Rawlinson, along with husband Keith, her sister Crystal and fiancé Dallas, had been visiting friends in Vernon and left around 1 a.m. heading south on Highway 97. Meanwhile, Scott Mann had left a house party in Kelowna and was driving north on the same highway. At 3 a.m. near the top of a rise, the two small cars met head-on. Mann had crossed the center line. Janet Rawlinson was the only survivor. There was uh, uh, another driver on the road. He was uh, five times over the legal limit for alcohol. And he had ecstasy and crystal meth in his system. And right about there, he uh, came over the barrier and was coming into our lane. Um, we were just probably right by that sign and um, Keith was swerving out of the way. And I couldn't tell whether his car was a bike or a vehicle, like a car. Um, I was in the passenger seat, Christy was in the back behind my husband and um, her boyfriend was behind me um, and I remember Christy leaning forward and I was saying to Christy, what the hell is Buddy doing? And she goes, I don't know and I was like, 
is that a car or a bike? And she goes, I don't know. And then I woke up in a hospital bed. Um, Keith didn't make it. Christy didn't make it. Dallas didn't make it. And neither did the other driver. There's no reason that I should be here. Um, my head was split open. My collarbone was broken. My ribs were broken. My neck was fractured. My back was fractured. My hips were broken. My pelvis was broken. And my leg was shattered. My hand was broken. Um, those are the outside injuries that I had. Inside, there's the brain injury, uh, my heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, um, my spleen, my stomach, my everything, every main organ that you need to survive, it was smashed. And my aorta, um, which is the main vessel in your body, it goes from your heart and it goes all over. Um, but it went from my heart to my belly button, it split in half. Right there, that should have killed me, medically speaking, that should have killed me within five minutes. Um, the jaws of life were used to get all of us out of the vehicle. Um, Christy and Keith both died on impact. Um, Dallas had a faint heartbeat, and when they were taking him out of the car, he died. Um, I went through, I, I still go through <laughs> a lot of therapy and uh, sur surgeries. Um, it, it blows me away that I'm here. I hope that when people pass by here, they think about things when they get in a vehicle. You know, what, what does it matter if you're there two minutes ahead of time? What's the risk you're taking? Are you gonna step in a vehicle after you've drank or done drugs? Or if you're, you know, if your mood's not settled? A lot of us take these things for granted and we don't think about those things, you know, like you get in a vehicle and you do, you do your everyday thing and, and you go about your life, but accidents happen and it doesn't take that long, you know, um, in the blink of an eye, that's how long it took and, uh, you know, this didn't just affect me, it affected his mom, it affected her mom, it affected her dad, it affected his parents, it affected any brothers or sisters, nieces, nephews, sons and daughters, you know. Now when I see somebody driving irrationally or a little too fast, I just go to myself, they've obviously never lost a loved one in a traffic accident, so. <laughs> Just when you do see a roadside remora, remember somebody lost their life. There's still a family grieving. These are sites of memory. Uh, they're not just sites of grief, they're sites of memory. And is that something that's, that's healthy, that's effective? Just to remind ourselves, things are done differently elsewhere. In, in Nova Scotia, uh, the Department of Highways manufactures little white crosses for every person who is killed by a drunk driver. And it's really tough to get a roadside memorial to stay up in Nova Scotia unless, you, you know, you, if you haven't been killed by a, by a drunk driver, you're probably not going to have a shrine for very long. Um, they charge these in for, for, they charge money, good money for these in California. Uh, in some jurisdictions, the state manufactures a sign. And in, in France, there are these really quite spectacular outlines of, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're very st stylistic, the outlines of people. Uh, that look like inverted exclamation marks, really, with arms, and uh, with a big red lightning bolt through the middle. And you'll see these assembled beside the road, little families of these, these, these figures. 
Um, so, so the the process, the, the practice of, 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 of individuals uh, creating these these really very very different and inventive in many instances uh, roadside death memorials in British Columbia. That's not necessarily the universal experience. So uh, it makes it. It speaks to British Columbian culture, British Columbian practices, and British Columbian history, I think, in a very profound way. It, uh, uh, it's, it's rather different from an official history. It's the, the history of, of, of the regular folks' practices. Slow down, you know? It's, uh, every day is a day where we get to, we get to make choices and, you know, when I leave this world, I hope that I'm remembered the way that Christy and Keith are. Is it because of Daddy? Say a prayer for 